are very excited to have him here. Not only has he, is he showing here, just right around the corner, his work is there, but he also showed here for Vida Morte Justicia, which was curated by Jorge Rojas and Maria Del Mar Gonzalez Gonzalez. Um, so we're very familiar and we're really excited to have you here. Um, this wouldn't be possible without the state of Utah. This is a statewide annual, as well as Weber County Ramp and Rocky Mountain Power Foundation. So thank you so much for everyone and off to you. Awesome, thanks for the introduction. <laughs> it's good to be here tonight. I'm excited to talk about my work and talk a little bit about my trajectory and how I got here and am doing the things that I'm doing. So I'm gonna just come over here. This is a nice intimate environment. So if you guys don't mind, I'm just gonna sit down and we'll have a little conversation. <laughs> so. Um, so again, my name is Horacio Rodriguez. I'm a ceramic artist. I also consider myself an educator and a curator. So originally from Houston, Texas, big city. Um, it was great growing up there. I had a lot of access to museums and cultural events and food and all kinds of really interesting things. So <clears throat> for me, these were my big three when I was growing up. The Museum of Fine Arts Houston, Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston and the Menil Collection. My mom was a professor at the University of St. Thomas and that's where the Menil Collection was. And in the summers, she would drop me off and I would just wander around the museums. And this also happened to be the neighborhood that had the tattoo parlors and all of the other kind of fun record stores. And she wonders how I turned out the way I did. <laughs> so having access to all of these was really incredible and I think really important for my development. Let me flip here. So um, I went off to college when I was 18. I was in a hurry to get out of Texas. Um, it was really stifling. And looking back now being older, I realized that growing up in Houston was pretty awesome. But you know, when you're a teenager, you want to get away from where you grew up. Um, so I left Texas and I got a scholarship to go to school in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, and I was 18 years old and I went off to college and I failed out. <laughs> I lost my scholarship. So I, and the, the problem was, is that I had majored in something that I was pressured into majoring in. I always wanted to do art since I was a teenager, but I had pressure from my family that, oh, you can't be an artist. You're never gonna make any money. You should study filmmaking. So I went to Santa Fe and I studied filmmaking and I completely failed out. Um, so I spent some time just kind of kicking around the West. I went to Los Angeles. I worked for a photographer there um, and went to community college and I bounced back to the University of Wyoming. And eventually I ended up at the University of Redlands um, my last uh, two years and I got a degree in sculpture and ceramics. When I was at the community college, I took a class called Mexican art. And I grew up in Houston in a part of town that was pretty much the white part of town. It was the upper middle class part of town. And even though my father was Mexican and my mom was Puerto Rican, I didn't really feel that much connection to my culture um, when it came to the food, when it came to the language, my Spanish was horrible. And so, I took this class um, at Cerritos Community College in Los Angeles, and it was called Mexican Art. And this class just changed my life. And it was a survey class that went from pre-Columbian art all the way up to like the muralists in the 20s. And so after I graduated from college, I was like, I have to go and discover this place that my ancestors come from. So I spent a couple of years traveling around Latin America Mexico, mainly in Central America, just trying to rediscover my roots and where I came from. At that time too, I also took Spanish language classes in Cuernavaca, and I just really wanted to discover the art, the food, the architecture of my ancestors. Here are some of the places that I visited. Um, and I visited some of these places multiple times because they're just really meaningful to me. These pyramids are mainly located in the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, Coba is probably my favorite place I've ever been. It's the most like Indiana Jones you can get. You go 
and you get a you can rent a bicycle and you get a bicycle and you can you can kind of pedal around because the ruins are spread out over this just ginormous space and they're just there's so many pyramids that are still just completely covered with the uh, jungle overgrowth and it's just a really special place so after my travels i came back to houston and i started teaching on the east side of town um, at Cesar Chavez High School. Um, and I got a job teaching art. I was teaching photography. I was teaching ceramics and digital art. And I spent 10 years teaching at Chavez High School. I kind of got sucked in. And um, I really grew to just love the community and love teaching this community. And I would hear the stories of how they, some of my students had come across the border, how their families had come across the border and the struggles that they'd had and the violence that is committed on the border. We did, uh, in Houston every year, there's an art car parade and we did a Cesar Chavez art car my first year there. And uh, we actually won first place in the student division. I was really proud of that. That was fun. So I'm, I'm working at Chavez now and the more time that I spent working there, the less art I made. It, it just happened that I just got immersed in teaching and each year I made less and less and less art. And at about seven years in, I got pretty, <laughs> I don't know, even know what the words are. I just was, I felt like I was just spinning my wheels and I was kind of at a crossroads. The job I liked well enough, I could have stayed there, I could have retired there, but I decided that I really wanted to push myself and at this time, around 2010, I got a fellowship to go to Japan and study the ceramics of Japan. And I went in 2010 and I spent six weeks in Japan. I stayed with artists. I traveled around the country. I got a rail pass. And I saw all of these artists making a living doing ceramics and doing what they loved. They had a studio practice. And I just was like, this is what I need to do. This is what I always wanted to do. So, flip ahead here. I spent the next three years developing a body of work so I could get into grad school. I hadn't been making art in a while, so it took me three years to get a strong enough portfolio to have the guts to apply to grad school. And at this time, I started to meld um, my photography and digital images with the ceramics. And at this point, I was still really making functional ceramics. I was making plates, bowls, and cups. Um, and so I got into grad school with, this is some of the work that was in my portfolio at the time. And I got into grad school at Montana State University. Um, so I left my teaching job at Chavez. I sold my house. I sold my car. I sold my boat. I sold everything and packed up my family and we moved to Bozeman, Montana in 2013. And these are, the, these are some of the, the people I was in grad school with. They had a really good grad program, especially for ceramics. Um, that was the view out of my studio window for three years and I fell in love with that view. I miss it all the time. And so in grad school, when I got there, the head of the department was like, we don't make pottery over here. We make real art. We make sculpture. <laughs> so they pushed me, which I realized now was a really good thing, that they pushed me to learn how to make sculpture. And at this, this is the point where I started doing uh, slip cast ceramics, sculptural ceramics. I got, um, I put together a ceramic de decal printer that could print in full color. I learned how to screen print on clay. And I just, this really just kind of upped my work and, and what I was doing. And I got really excited about all these new processes and possibilities. And it's funny, the, the work that I make today, some of it is still from grad school, things that I investigated and explored and was like, I'm gonna put a pin in this and come back to it at some point. And I'm getting to come back to some of those things now. And that's really exciting. So this was some of my work in grad school, in the beginning of grad school. And then 
This is about 2014. I started taking trips down to the border. I had some friends that lived in Tijuana and they told me there's a lot of crazy things happening. You need to come down here and see what's going on. So I went down and this was about the time that Trump was starting to think about running for president and was making lots of really inflammatory comments about Mexicans and people crossing the border. This was a, a mural painted on the border wall. It's since, it's since gone now, but it was really interesting, I thought. It's kind of offensive too, but um, you know, Trump really was calling people that were coming over the border bad hombres, rapists, calling them lots of really bad names. So I thought it was pretty, pretty ingenious uh, mural there. I did a photography series on the border at the time, and one of the photos from the series is here. And this is where the border wall juts into the Pacific Ocean, um, right there on the border of San Diego and Tijuana. And it was really crazy. I'd never really spent much time there. It just was crazy that this wall was like jutting 300 feet into the ocean. Um, and then on the, on the Mexican side of the wall, there were murals, there were thoughtful quotes, there were families walking along the beach, there were kids playing soccer, people just generally living their life. And on the other side of this wall was just this militarized zone. And the shadows, this was made right in the evening, I took this picture, and the shadows look like they're probably coming from the setting sun, but they're actually coming from the spotlights that they have shining down into the wall. They make these really long, beautiful shadows. So I spent some time down there and I'm, this kind of changed how I thought about my work. And I thought I want to use my work to talk about different things that are happening and kind of open up the eyes of people, especially that are living in Bozeman, Montana. So I had my thesis show and I actually built a border wall in the gallery and to be able to see the show, you had to cross the wall. So the wall kind of mimicked how it looked going into the ocean. And then it, it touched right there against the wall. And you could, you could walk over that part. I didn't make anybody do anything crazy to get over the wall. But um, yeah, so if you wanted to see the show, you had to cross the wall. These are some artwork examples that came out of that time. Um, right about the time that I graduated. And so can I ask you a question? Sure. About your previous um, yes. school work. Um, what was the reaction from those who came in to see your... You know, the reaction was, was awesome. Yeah, I, I've never really been confronted in a negative way about my work. And I think part of the reason that is is because excuse me, a lot of the people that are coming to see my work and to see the shows are pretty liberal minded people who are kind of on the same page as, that I am. You know what I mean? So the reaction was awesome. I had a great reaction. And I think what I wanted to do was Montana is so far from the border. I just kind of wanted to bring some of that up to Montana and just kind of educate. And this is what's happening. You know, this is what's going on. Um, and I had it in this show photography as well as ceramics. And that's something that's going to carry on, um, you know, as I go on and, and do my work. Um, so these are some of the pieces that were in that show. Um, and I realized today I was kind of going over this presentation again. And I realized that most of these pieces are now in permanent collections. And I feel really good about that. So. Um, I had a show, and I'm going to show some pictures from that show um, at the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. And last month, they decided to buy four of my pieces for their permanent collection. So, yeah, I'm super psyched about that. So these two pieces they bought, and that piece over there on the end um, is in the Salt Lake County permanent collection. So I'm really happy that the pieces have found a good home, um, and they'll be able to be there, you know, which is really awesome. Um, so this is my artwork at this point. It was mainly comprised of slipcast ceramics and computer generated ceramic decals. A lot of the imagery that I do on my work, I start in Photoshop or Illustrator um, and to create the images and then I make them into ceramic decal and then those are then put onto the pieces. 
Um, I view the slipcast object as a canvas where I can create meaning, tell stories, and investigate relationships. Political in nature, dealing with themes of identity, racism, assimilation, immigration, appropriation, and the U.S.-Mexico border. So that was my work leaving grad school. And then, as soon as I graduated grad school, I didn't really know what I was going to do. I was kind of thinking that maybe I'm going to get a job teaching somewhere or, you know, what am I going to do? But this fellowship came up at the University of Utah at the last minute and I applied for it. And lo and behold, I got it. You know, I was just as shocked as anybody. So I got the, um, it's called the uh, Raymond C. Morales Postdoctoral Teaching Fellowship. And I got that in 2016 and I moved to Utah and there was the studio that they gave me. So I had a studio space that they gave me and, they, and I was also teaching ceramics um, at the University of Utah. And so my second year there, I co-taught a class with the School of Architecture. It was called Sustainable Design Solutions. And that's when I learned that the University of Utah has all kinds of amazing equipment at your, that you can use at your disposal if you're a student or a professor there. So I discovered this thing called the Digital Matters Lab. And when I was doing the architecture class, I was introduced to all of these tools and technology. And one of the tools and technologies that I was introduced to is 3D scanning and 3D printing. So my imagination was just like, whoa, what, what can I do with this? So I had been since college, since my grad school days, I'd been collecting artifacts from Mexico, uh, Mesoamerican artifacts. So I brought one of my artifacts um, and we did a 3D scan of it. Um, and this is the first time I ever used the technology with the help of the Digital Matters Lab. And from that scan, we were able to create a file, which I was then able to 3D print um, in a 3D printer. Um, let's see. So I developed this process of 3D printing or 3D scanning a Mesoamerican object, making a traditional ceramic mold of the piece, and then making a slip cast replica. And I kind of just figured out how to take this piece, this ancient object, and turn it into something that I could re reproduce over and over and use to make my art with. So here's a, an example of the first one that I made there. And this one I blew up because the piece was a little bit small. I blew it up. And then here are some of the multiples that I made. And this was my first one. I'm just kind of playing around, trying to figure out what I can do with this technology. So I'd also been collecting these heads. And these heads are, they come from Mexican shaft tombs in Western Mexico. And they're actually grave goods. So people went in and they dug up the graves and they took these objects and then they sold them to people. Um, you know, mainly here in the United States. So the problem with that is that since these objects were kind of taken like that out of context, they don't know a lot about these cultures because all of the objects were dispersed all over the world. So I took part in buying some of these. I've had some mixed feelings since then about owning some of these objects, but this, I had bought this group of heads from this auction um, in Florida, and I, saw, I started scanning these, and the heads were pretty small. They were like these little broken fragments. And so I started scanning these, and this was kind of like my second iteration. Oh, that picture is not working. Look at that. Oh. Okay, ah, we got it. Yay, okay, cool. Yay. Okay, good. We're good. And it's showing the picture that I wanted to show you. Okay. Kelly, are you interrupting? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay. So getting back to my story, Gretchen from um, the UMFA, she gave me access to six pieces from their permanent collection. And I was completely shocked and thrilled. And at first they had told me, well, go up to the Mesoamerican collection 
pick out which ones you want to work with and we'll give you access to those. So I picked out a bunch of them and then they came back and they're like, well, actually those vitrines are really old. We're really scared about opening them up. We're not going to do that till we switch out the display, but we have these pieces in the basement that you might be interested in. <laughs> and I was like, oh, so they're just giving me like these like reject pieces that are in the basement. But when I saw the pieces that they were offering for me to scan, I was completely blown away. And it's then when I realized that some of the best pieces from that museum are hidden away in the basement of the museum, you know? So they gave me access and we went in with the, with the scanner and we were able to scan all of these really incredible pieces. Um, and I couldn't have done it with the, without the people at the Digital Matters Lab. Um, so they did, they helped me with a lot of the technology part of this because I'm a ceramic artist. I don't do normally this type of work. So we had to like take those scans and we modeled them in this software called Blender. And then from there, we were able to print them out. And these, they have really large scale 3D printers um, at the University of Utah. And we were able to print out the Veracruz figure, which is there in the middle. We were able to print it out full size. And you're gonna see that figure pop up again in my work. So this, this is a seated woman figure from Veracruz. And all I know about it is that they would put these in the graves, but they normally would break them and then put them in the grave. So to be able to have one and find one that was still intact, it's my understanding from Luke who, who works with the collection there, was very, was an awesome thing because most of these were found broken. Um, so, I'm sorry, what was your original question? No, no, I, I was just wondering, so when you showed that first photo, it just seemed so lifelike to me. Oh, uh, the expression on that face is just, I mean, you just feel it. And it's one of the reasons why I use this face later on in my work, you'll see. And I was just curious if it was a, like a person of some significance, royalty, or... That's a great question, but, and I don't have an answer for you. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, let's see where we at, okay. So here's some more pictures. And then this all led up to my first major show here in Salt Lake, and that was at the Finch Lane Gallery. And these are pieces from the scanned work. So you can see there the child in the cage that was from the child figure I had scanned. This was another one of the, the smaller heads that I had scanned. And about the time that I made the sculpture of the child in the cage, this was the time um, when Trump was president and they were putting all of the children, they were coming up into the border, separating from their parents and putting them in detention. So I used this ancient sculpture to kind of stand in for what's happening modern day now with the people from the same area that the sculpture is originally from. And that family group that I scanned, those sculptures are roughly 1,200 years old. Here's some more pieces from that show, from the heads. And then this, is, this piece was in that Finch Lane show, and this is the piece that is right over here in the next gallery. Um, and this, the name of this piece is Educate, Engage, Resist. And this piece came about, um, I read uh, somebody who was really, in, in college I started reading this linguistics person, his name was Paulo Freire, and he wrote a book called Pedagog Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And he talked about social justice and dem democracy being tied to teaching and learning and the emancipation from oppression. So that is what this piece is about um, that is here in this gallery. And this piece was made from those original family, that family group, but these are a really small version of the mother figure. Um, and then skipping ahead, um, this is one of the other pieces that is here in the show 
the one there on the left. It's from the Colossal Head series. Um, after leaving um, the University of Utah in 2019, I got a residency at the Utah Museum of Contemporary Arts. And it was kind of broken up by COVID. It was a, kind of a weird residency. I ended up doing a lot of it at my house. I was building a studio at the time, but I had this show in January of 2021. Um, and that's where this other piece comes from that is um, in the other gallery there. This piece is significant and I held on to this one because this was me experimenting with a lot of new techniques. First of all, I slip cast terracotta clay, which is something I'd never done before, but there's a lot of different surface techniques going on in the head. There's screen printing, there's ceramic decals, there's gold luster, and there's a couple of other transfer techniques. So I wanted to hold on to this piece because it really was kind of a turning point for me and doing surface decoration on my pieces. And then, in the summer of 2021, I decided I needed to get back to the border and kind of get a hands-on feel for what's happening there. I had a friend of mine who was talking about this group called Battalion Search and Rescue. And they are a humanitarian group that work in the borderlands in Arizona. And they do uh, search and rescue and mainly they do recovery of remains. So they try to reunite the remains that they find in the borderlands back with the families through DNA testing. So I volunteered now with them two summers in a row um, and I've gone down and this was as, as much as it was me like helping and being out there and, and trying to do some good. It was also me like really trying to figure out what is this problem down at the border? What's going on? You know, who are the different players? And spending time down there, I realized just how much money has been wasted creating this border wall. And so the example there on the right I show you is this tiny piece of border wall that's probably about 40 feet long who knows why it was erected there, but you can just walk right around it. It's the most <laughs> ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. The other thing though that was not so cool is a lot of the area there on the border is like national preserve. There's, it's a wildlife refuge right there on the border. And as soon as Biden took office, all of the work on the border wall stopped and they just left all of the junk and the materials just sitting out. So it's just sitting there wasting away. And what they've ended up doing is they blocked a lot of habitat access where animals would freely go back and forth. There's a lot of marshland there and it's, it's just an incredible waste. And um, yeah, so, it was really meaningful to spend time down there and it really helped for my next show to just kind of like get, put everything into perspective and figure out how everything was working. Um, and this was my most recent show, which was at the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. It was called Salt 15. And a lot of these border issues I brought into and, and talk about in this show. So this show too also, um, I pushed myself to do more of an installation. So the show has ceramic sculpture, it has photography, and it also has video all in the same show. And I tried to create an immersive environment that people could go into and reflect on the crisis in the border. I had the, this, this, I'm going to call it an altar. It also serves as a screen. Um, where my projection was on the other side. And if you look down at the bottom, you can see different objects laying there. Um, and these are some of the objects I collected in my travels in the borderlands. You start to see a lot of the same objects, these carpet shoes that the migrants use to kind of cover their tracks and not leave footprints. They create these really intricate holders for water bottles. So you see everywhere is littered with these really, these black water bottles, camo backpacks, camo hats, and you start seeing the same items over and over. 
And um, after talking to some of the other members of Battalion Search and Rescue, they're actually like these REI on the border on the Mexican side that the migrants go to to get ripped off and buy these supplies that they use to help get them across the border. So they, the, the migrants coming across are, are getting abused at every turn. People are making money off them. People are ripping them off. And it's, it's very tragic what's happening down there. Um, so also included in my show, thankfully, I was able to put the mother and father figure um, into the show. So these are the actual objects I scanned. And they belong, this guy, the yellow one that I made, is the child figure that belongs to these two adults. And these three were found together. And like I said earlier, those sculptures are roughly about 1,200 years old. They come from shaft tombs in western Mexico. Here's another view. And then this is the piece I made with that seated figure from Veracruz. And this is piece was called the Yuma 14. When I was down um, in Arizona, I read a book called The Devil's Highway, and it talks about this group of migrants that mainly came from um, Veracruz, Mexico, and 21 people died on that crossing trip, and it was the largest mass casualty event um, that, is, that is still, that happened in the border. I think it happened in 2001. So I made 14 heads to represent the 14 lives that were lost. And each of them, they're not directly related to any one individual, but each of them tell bits and parts of the story of the crossing of the coming over. And again, the expression on that sculpture on the face is such a haunting expression. And to be able to use the sculpture that came from Veracruz, and most of the migrants that perished were also from Veracruz again, I'm using this ancient object to kind of tell the story of what's happening modern day. And I just feel really fortunate and blessed that I could tell the story. Here's one of the heads, um, a close up view. And let's see. And then the last piece I'm going to talk about are uh, these slip cast water bottles, Agua es vida, el agua es vida, water is life. And I made these to talk about the, how sacred the water is to the migrants as they cross. And like I said before, and I'd put on the altar there, they make these really interesting straps and ways to carry these bottles of water. So I took one of these water bottles, I made a mold from it and I slip cast three of them. And then I used strapping from some of the backpacks that I found out in the desert for this piece. And then you can tell probably here in this piece, the part that's holding onto the water bottle is a noose that I created to kind of represent the stranglehold that the United States has on the migrants and, and what's happening there in the country. This piece too, I'm very happy to say that the Utah Museum of Fine Arts purchased this as one of the four pieces. And this is gonna be in their permanent collection, which makes me so happy that it's found a good home and it's gonna be there and it's gonna be preserved. And then, that's kind of it. Um, I just put a little bit of what's coming up for me in 2023. I'm super excited about this year. I have a lot of awesome things planned. Next month, I'm going to uh, Mexico City for the Zonamaco Contemporary Art Fair. Um, that's gonna be kind of my first big trip. I have a show that I'm curating that's gonna be um, at the Utah Museum of Contemporary Arts, and it is called the Boombox Benefit Show. And I've created 10 slip cast boom boxes, and I've distributed nine of them to other local artists um, in Salt Lake area. And each of them is kind of doing their thing to the boom box, their surface design, their vision. And each one of the boom boxes is gonna be auctioned off to support um, a nonprofit, socially justice-minded organization in the Salt Lake City area. So each of the artists has chosen their own organization that they wanna uplift and they wanna support 
we're going to auction these off and hopefully raise some money um, for these organizations around Salt Lake City. That's coming up in March. And so why, why, the, why the boombox? Well, the, that's a great question. I have a lot of connections to that boombox form. It was actually my boombox when I, I got for Christmas in fifth grade wow. that I cast. But apart from that, the boombox, I mean, really, if you think about the boombox, it was an object used to like project music, project sound. If you grew up like I did in the 80s, you know, the boombox was just a really iconic object. So I picked these objects because they're kind of like being opening up and being loud and, and talking about these different organizations along with the artist who's going to do um, the surface design on there. I thought it was a good object for that. Um, I have a group show that I'm going to be in um, at the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Arts. In March, also, it's called Language in Times of Miscommunication. And then I am doing a visiting artist lecture series um, at Eastern Washington University and the Northwest Museum of Arts and Cultures. I think that's in April. So pretty busy this year. I'm excited about what's to come. I'm excited about what I've done. It's nice to kind of just sit down and talk about what I've done the last 10 years. I went to grad school in 2013. It's 2023. I feel like I've done a lot in 10 years um, and I'm really happy with where I'm at. So thank you guys for coming and, and listening to my spiel. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Two of the, my pieces are in this next gallery right over here. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you guys. Except if your name is Jorge, no questions from Jorge. Jorge always asks me really hard questions. <laughs> yeah, don't be shy. I have a question. Uh, I, I would love for you to explain why you put the contemporary logos, the designer logos. On All right, Jorge. <laughs> um, so I did. I didn't show any of those pieces, but I think the piece you're referring to are the bad ombre pistols. No, you have like the Louis Vuitton, Louis Vuitton like, the like the, you know, the, the designer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, on the Molotov cocktails. Yeah. <laughs> My wife. Uh, <laughs> so I use those luxury designer logos to talk about assimilation and appropriation and one, I originally had started using those logos to talk about uh, people who have come to this country and they pick up on the designer logos and they kind of embrace that as kind of a statement of saying, hey, I've made that, I've made it here, I'm something, I have money, I'm somebody now. But the flip side also to, the, to that is that a lot of the luxury houses like Chanel and Louis Vuitton, they have appropriated indigenous designs from Mexico and put them on their clothes and, and on their handbags. And so it was just kind of a way to flip it around a little bit and appropriate something from those designer labels. No, I'm, I'm really, everybody that asked me that, I'm like, it would be so awesome if I got a cease and desist letter. So, and actually those, the bad ombre pistols with the designer logos, those are the biggest sellers at the gallery that represents me in Park City. So wow. all day long, people are buying those pistols, not actually knowing what they're buying. So <laughs> it's kind of an inside joke with me and the gallery owner about all the rich people buying the Louis Vuitton pistols in Park City. So sold two last week. So I love those pistols. <laughs> yes. So you mentioned the boombox and their significance to you, but also what role does hip hop uh, through uh, the graffiti text on the pieces and also like how it gets well play in your art and uh, presentation of, of it? Well, and I think we've talked about this before. Um, so 
Yeah, there are bands like Bad Brains who really fused like these really, like they're taking reggae and they're taking punk rock and they're melding them together. And it's just this kind of like hybrid combination of, of things. So I just have, growing up this whole time, I've just loved to take these different things from my childhood and mix and match them with other things and create like these new interesting hybrid forms. So I think that that, is where I'm coming from with most of that. Is that, did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. So he actually interviewed me for Slug Magazine way back before that Finch Lane show. And that was way before I was doing as good as I'm doing now. So I'm so, it's so happy that you were able to come and, and see me talk and. You're on the up and up already, so. Well. <laughs> Thanks for that, but it's nice to see you here. Does anybody else have any other questions? Yes. So I have a question about your time on the borderlands. So yes. I used to live in Arizona, and I okay. have family in Southern Arizona. So yeah. just, you know, really very curious about the area, what your experience was like, and just any experiences with the other locals or any of, like, the federal agencies that were highlights for you with your time down there. Um, so I've had mixed experiences. Um, I'm was actually really surprised the first time I went down there that because I ran into lots of Border Patrol agents um, and most of them didn't really pay any attention to me. Um, and so I was, I was out taking photographs and, and walking around and we got more, I got more hassled when I was with the battalion search and rescue because we're like with a humanitarian group, we're normally like in a caravan with other, other cars and stuff. And we're clearly labeled as to who we are and what we're doing. And so we would get, you know, harassed a little bit. Um, but for the most part, my experiences were really, really good. And just being out and, experiencing what the migrants go through, you know? I mean, the, I think we would hike maybe six to eight miles a day. And, you know, it's in August is 110 degrees. And I just got, I, I was just in awe at how people are walking 30, 40, 50 miles a day in this heat with no water, the desperation that must be felt to like leave everything behind and just walk in the desert and, and trust somebody. Um, the other thing that I was really surprised with was that how the migrants are ripped off at every turn. Not surprised, surprised isn't the word, but just, you know, they're ripped off by just local people that live on the border that are selling them supplies to cross, you know, and they're ripped off by the cartels that are charging them all this money to go and then just drop them off and abandon them. So it really opened my eyes and I made a commitment to go back and volunteer with Battalion Search and Rescue every year. So I will be going back this year because it's important work. And like I said, most of the time, some of the times pe people run into that can be helped, but a lot of the times it's just recovery. Yes. You mentioned your Mexican Puerto Rican heritage. Yes. Yes, I, I, my mom is Puerto Rican and my dad is Mexican, but I grew up not with my dad, but with a stepdad. So I grew up really, I feel connected to my Puerto Rican side of the culture. I'd been to the island a lot. You know, my family lives in Miami. So I felt really connected to that side. The side I didn't know about was my Mexican side. Um, but I realized that I, hadn't really spent that much time in Puerto Rico or focusing on my roots in Puerto Rico. So f I was fortunate, my wife and I were fortunate enough this past year, year and a half now, we actually bought a place in Puerto Rico. So I've been spending time in Puerto Rico and I'm really, really looking forward to doing some projects and some work in Puerto Rico. Um, when I was there about a year and a half ago, I was at the museum in San Juan, and there is a really strong clay community of people there working in ceramics. So that is completely untapped, and that is next on my list for sure. Yes. So how has the creation of this work shaped your connection to your heritage? I, 
I mean, I feel like I started in grad school on this journey of self-discovery and I was able to like discover things about myself, language and culturally where I was from. It's amazing those DNA tests now can kind of pinpoint the area of where your ancestors were from. And my answers, ancestors are from Western Mexico, from Zacatecas area where some of these sculptures actually that I work with are from. So I would say that it has helped enormously but I kind of started out on a journey of self-discovery. And as I went on and as I realized that there were bigger issues and bigger problems, I kind of started to be a little bit more global and not, not just want to discover things about myself, but also help other people, you know? And, and I think that that's really been what my connection to battalion has been and my last show, just trying to tell the story of what's happening down there. And you know, these are my people, like it's a couple of generations removed, but one of the pieces I made um, that's gonna be in Scottsdale is called Brown Boys for 45. And that piece was about um, the population of the students I taught at Chavez. A lot of the males, uh, the maybe one generation in the United States were pro-Trump and anti-immigration. And it just really blew my mind that you can, you know, come here and your family struggle to get here and work hard and make a better life for yourself. And then you want to turn around and close the door behind you and not want to allow that for anybody else. So I feel like, you know, for my position, because I've, I've received an education, I, you know, come from middle class background, that I'm in a position where I can help other people and I'm going to do that. So. Sorry guys, I'm just going to interrupt just for a minute. Uh, there's going to be music starting. Yes. Three, three minutes. So I just want to make sure it, it can get loud. So. That sounds, I think we're wrapping it up. Yeah. Thank you.